Good day to all our listeners and welcome to Casting Light with uh, me, JV from the Lighthouse Arabia Center for Wellbeing. With me today, I have Dahlia Alziot, our SLT. And for those of you who do not know what that is, it's our speech and language therapist. Yes, we have our own Dahlia. Dahlia, welcome here and thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Thank you. Dahlia, I have a challenge for you. I want okay. you to repeat after me. How many wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? How many woods would a woodchuck chuck? That's it. Oh, no. <laughs> being, a speech, no. being a speech therapist doesn't mean you're good at talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pulling, pulling your socks. Welcome here, Dahlia. Today we're going to talk about, about what a speech and language therapist does, as, as well as what you have noticed in this recent months, and what um, guidelines you can give uh, a parent regarding how they can assist their children. I think if you would be so kind to, to inform uh, me and our listeners as to what a speech and language therapist does. Okay. <clears throat> so a speech and language therapist from the name, we can begin with the term speech. It has to do with the production of speech sound. So we're talking how the sounds are actually articulated. When we say language, we're talking about two parts. There's receptive language, which has to do with the understanding of the language around us, following directions, responding to questions, and there's the expressive language part of language, which is using sentences to communicate with others. It has to do also with the structure of the sentence in terms of grammar. Um, and uh, the last part is also written language. So it's not only spoken language. Speech and language therapists work with written language forms. Um, the third part, which is not mentioned in the title for some reason, is the pragmatics and the social aspects of language. Language cannot be um, communicated unless there is an interaction with another person. So social skills and pragmatics are an essential part of what speech and language therapists do. So in any evaluation or any intervention, you will always see targets that are working on social interaction. Whenever there's issues with uh, speech or language, even though it might not be the main concern for the parents, as professionals, we know that there must be an underlying social skill that is not yet developed due to the delay in the other parts of language. So it, it goes hand in hand. Um, a little bit more about the so, uh, social part of language. It comes from the social um, uh, interaction with others. So skills like problem solving, negotiation, um, politeness, requesting, all these skills are social skills that if language is impaired, these skills are impaired. And if these skills are impaired and the social interaction is not um, age appropriate, there must be an underlying language development issue. So that's when we come. That's when we look at the child's development. Um, we look at the milestones and we we'll see where we can help. And we try to be as holistic as possible. We try to be inclusive of all the skills that we want to work on and not only target the expressive aspect of it, which is usually what parents notice first. My child doesn't talk, and then they assume that everything else is okay. Um, and that's when we dig deeper and do our evaluations and explain to, to parents and to schools and teachers that there's more than just um, the words that we, we say. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Um, I think it's very important for other clinicians, for parents, for educators, to understand the integral role that uh, an SLT plays in the holistic treatment of a child's development, where we as clinicians, as uh, therapists, psychologists, uh, address the emotional and behavioral and, and, and uh, thought aspect thereof. Um, that big part of that, and, or an interplay, is the struggle to communicate due to either a physical difficulty in forming the sounds or expressing it, but also in the reception of it, understanding, being able to read the social cues, cues to be able to, to mimic, to read, to, to, to know how to interact and the subsequent emotional impact that has if I have difficulty with that. 
So an yeah. SLT forms an in integral part of a treatment plan for a child's developmental delays or social adjustment to an environment. Mm -hmm. Have I got it? Yes, uh, one more part about what you mentioned earlier. Um, one of the most important questions that we ask parents, and a lot of them sometimes show some signs that they, they didn't think about it before, which is, is your child showing any signs of frustration yet? And for them, oh, but they can't express frustration. And this is really very important. If children are, they are frustrated when they cannot communicate their needs, even if they're young, even if they're three years old, you can see their body language, you can see the stress and anxiety expressed due to the lack of uh, communication as well. So Absolutely. as you said, it's a very integral part. You, you cannot miss a, one part and work on the other. Yeah, it's not just about uttering words. Yes, it's way beyond that. It's way beyond that. And as, as a wise man once said, if a monologue was given, but no one heard the monologue, uh, was the monologue ever given? As you said there, the words, there's no purpose for communication if there is no interaction. Yes. It is about how do we enable children um, to master the skill of expressing, of understanding, and therefore being able to interact in a meaningful way with their surroundings and within their social environments and spheres. So now, given the situation that we find ourselves in, the whole world, it is not what we used to know. Um, interaction looks different. We have to keep social distance. We are wearing masks everywhere we go. Children are not free to roam and interact um, on playgrounds, at schools. Things are different. And the way we interact is different. What have you noticed is the impact of this on the speech and language and communication development of children? Um, to be honest, JV, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, all the speech therapists that we talk among each other, we really expressed a lot of worry because we know there are children who already have, um, at, who are at risk, who have red flags for language difficulties. But at the same time, knowing how language is learned and how language is acquired, that was the biggest red flag that we know the word social distance and restriction and lockdown means less learning opportunities for communication and for language. Um, some families, maybe they have siblings and they might have a more of advantage for their kids to interact among each other, but that's not everyone's um, case. Um, children who might be at home all the time with their parents, but parents are working online. They're missing on learning opportunities. Language is learned through listening, interacting, exchanging, and play. Uh, if children are not going on play dates anymore, they're not interacting with their peers. And it's not only adults, children need to interact with peers their age as well because they learn from imitation. So these restrictions really impacted uh, children's development. So far, there's no studies conclusive of the the long-term effect of language development in terms of how the pandemic affected it, but there's a few studies are in progress. And so far, there are some warning signs that we really need to worry about. If you are a parent who have a child that you worry about their language development, just waiting until things change might not be the wisest um, choice anymore. Maybe it was in the beginning, but right now there's other things that we can do instead of just waiting for the situation to change. Um, when it comes to actual therapy, there's so many changes that happened. And maybe uh, your next question might be touching on that as well. Um, obviously, as a speech therapist, the main focus for my child is to look at my lips moving, articulating sounds. Uh, sometimes we need to touch them um, on their face to give them some touch cues of how certain sounds are made. Uh, eye contact is important and joint attention is important. And with children with language difficulties, you can't do all of that with two meters apart. It, it's really difficult. Um, so we have to cross that two meter part, but we obviously, we still have our protective um, masks and our gloves as well. Um, but there are some, some kids that are missing on the visual input from just seeing the lips movement. 
Um, so for, we have different solutions for different cases, but it's really difficult that we need to look at every individual in, um, as a separate case and we need to understand their set of weakness, set of strengths, and what's the priority for now? Because we might not have the privilege to work on everything that we would have worked on in a normal situation, but we have the privilege to target specific weaknesses and know how to support these children with their communication as well. Yeah. Just listening to you, I've noticed in myself um, doing sessions online. On the one side, it, 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 it's more taxing on, on my whole nervous system working on a screen the whole day. But if I have to listen to someone online where I can see their whole face, yeah. In comparison to seeing someone, maybe uh, uh, if, if someone is at risk and I, uh, I see a person in, in uh, a client in person taking the necessary precautions with mask and distance, noticing having to listen to a client wearing a mask where I can only see the eyes, <laughs> it takes so much more effort to, to hear and to listen because I don't have that visual cues. I can't see and hear and interpret the message using more than one sense of just hearing and listening. And so I can only imagine trying to overcome certain communication difficulties whilst seeing everyone around me without seeing their mouths move. Yes. <laughs> so I, there's nothing that I can see that I can mimic and read the, the movement and try and imitate that. Um, and you've mentioned now children who were already at risk or already struggling with uh, speech and language difficulty. Is this impacting other children as well who were not necessarily flagged as, as, as a, a risk before the pandemic? Yes, it definitely does. As I said earlier, so far the research is not telling us the extent um, of the influence of the pandemic on uh, on uh, like everyone, on typically developed children and children at risk. But we can see that already. We can see it in the sentence length and sentence structure. Children are spending more screen time. Therefore, their, their functional use of language is becoming less and less. Um, the social part of language, they, they, children who used to speak in longer utterances, they're just using single words to communicate now because everything is through a screen. Um, they're not having conversations with their peers. The peer talk, which is really important into learning social rules of communication. We don't teach these um, directly. I was never taught how to wait for someone to finish speaking, then it's my turn to talk. I learned this from talking to my peers. And then I noticed the reactions when I don't give them uh, the space to talk as well. These things are affected and children are struggling with their interaction and going to school slowly we're seeing that and teachers are reporting it to us they're saying children used to be more lively they, they used to interact a lot now they're they're all apart from each other it's um we no longer hear conversations between children it might be just a short exchange of yes and no or a question and answer but they're missing on the um, communication and interaction part of the language so I would be worried about um, that in the future, especially for early intervention, the early years um, of language development. It's very critical and anything that impacts it can have a long-term impact. Absolutely, rather intervene early than having to struggle later on and try to catch up if a developmental milestone has not been successfully um, achieved. It's so much harder to catch up on that as there's different um, expectations uh, and requirements later on. And you mentioned there might be families where there are more siblings, so there's some interaction. And I think in some instances that is, uh, they're saving grace, but it's also not a diversity of interaction. No. And that is what we need in social development to be able to negotiate on the playground with someone who is friendly, someone who is uh, rude, someone who is shy, to learn how do I navigate my way socially and communicate my needs, my frustrations, 
So there's either this isolation, children who are by themselves or only interacting with adults who might be also under extreme pressure and anxiety or work long hours, or just their siblings, the same each day. And that my concern is that that becomes the reference yes. of, of the world and of, of, of social interaction. So this is really concerning, specifically for children in their early developmental uh, years. What would you recommend for parents to minimize the impact on the development of speech and communication and social skills, given our current situation? Yes. Um, so to answer your question, JB, I'll start with children who used to receive speech therapy services in person or children who are at risk and parents might be wondering, well, what can we do? We're, we're not comfortable yet going in person for therapy, for example. Uh, this is where teletherapy or speech teletherapy comes in place. And it's similar to schools. Children are doing it online, um, at least for some schools. Um, teletherapy has research data enough to back up that it's as successful as in-person speech therapy. However, it goes by individual cases. So for some cases where you can work on the production of certain speech sounds or working on the written language or social skill, sorry, the, the social rules, it might be doable through a Zoom meeting. However, there's more difficult cases or more severe delays that you require the in-person interaction, you require tactile cues, you need to to be physically there to support and prompt children. Um, so I would really encourage people and, and parents, especially with children in, um, at risk uh, for language um, learning difficulties, to really look into teletherapy and consult with your speech therapist and, and tell them, is that suitable for my child? And when we look at it, it's not only the child perspective. Uh, parents need to be involved. And it, this is really good for them because usually in-person sessions, that most of the time is for the child and parents would pay a whole year of therapy and not learn much of techniques that we can follow up at home and it's really important so teletherapy can be for the parents as well we can do parent training parent coaching um parents can take videos of their interaction with their children we can look at these videos and give them some uh tips and recommendations and comments okay you did this right this was something that you can improve so we can tailor the service to suit each family and each child's needs. Um, sometimes we just send home programs and we tell the parents exactly how to run them. Um, however, on the other hand, for uh, children who uh, might not have any risk factors for learning uh, language, however, we're just concerned about their social emotional development and social skills as well. Um, I'm gonna say a few things that I really find helpful um, before the pandemic and still applicable right now. So the first thing is reading. Story time routine is really important and essential. It's something that I tell any parent from day one who come to seek speech therapy services. Every single day, you need to choose a book. Books can be picture books, no words mentioned, and then you can go higher depending on your child's level. You need to establish that routine. Children learn from new experiences. And as you mentioned, we need diversity. And under one roof, in one home, in one room, you can't have much diversity, so you need to bring it in. You need to bring diverse books. And talk to your teachers, talk to your um, therapist, and tell them, recommend books that can really give more opportunities for my child to develop their language skills, even for normal children. With, uh, sorry, with typically developed children, we need to work on diversity of uh, experiences for learning. Children in Dubai might not experience snow. And if they were born in, within the pandemic, they will not know what snow is, right? So we need books on, on, the, on four seasons and tell them this is how it looks like and this is how it feels like. So these are really important experiences that we can expose them to. Another thing that we can do is um, board games. Board games are amazing for that because it, it makes more than one uh, person interact. It presents some extra challenges that normally you wouldn't have with your family members. You wanna see how your child would react to losing the game. How would they uh, request their return if someone skipped it on them? 
Um, so you can create more of the realistic challenges that they might face in the playground or they might face in their classroom or with peers. You can create them within the board game as well and work on that indirectly. And it does not require a lot of knowledge of the social skills. It will come naturally to, to parents because they learn these things from their environments and they will notice if their child um, did any behavior that they think it's inappropriate and they know what to target. And at the same time, they can praise any behaviors that they didn't think their children would have because they did not um, experience that specific uh, problem or that specific issue. Yeah. It creates the opportunity for the parent to be, become aware of the level at which my child interacts, yes. the level of tolerance, the negotiation skills, the interaction skills, and the opportunity then to respond to that. Yes. Um, so reading, story time, diversity, board games yes. to facilitate <laughs> it within the restrictions that we have um, and, and to bring, to, to find creative ways in which to bring what we have had to give up for a time period now into the home in other ways. Yes. Um, I'm also thinking the, the importance of having supper time as a family around a table where there's time to interact, um, to not be so fragmented, to have conversation. Uh, are there one or two tips that you can maybe give parents on how to, how to engage in conversation or, or communication with um, maybe young children and how to get them to, to, to help them to communicate. What tips, maybe two or three tips, can you give parents on how to engage in conversation with their little ones? Well, I, I will use the example you mentioned about supper time. And this is a really good, uh, um, let's say, opportunity to learn so many skills. So give your children responsibilities, give them tasks and challenge them. So to initiate a conversation, maybe ask them, what should we have for supper today? Make them vote, make them um, defend their opinions. Oh, why do you think we should have fish and chips today? But the, then the other child will say, well, we had it like last week. And then I think there's another reason to um, think of another dish for today. So creating um, debates kind of, uh, give them individual responsibilities. Don't give them the same responsibilities so they can see the, um, the reaction or the chain reaction of if one person didn't do their part, the other person wouldn't be able to do it. And then that will create more of a challenge for them to go and conversate and, and interact within each other as well. And during, time, during um, supper time, when they're sitting all on the same table, maybe they can have some questions about, they, they can't ask how was your day at school? Probably it was four or five hours in front of a screen. There's not much to, to talk about but maybe create opportunities of like imagining, well, how would you feel or what would you think that is the furthest place you ever want to visit? What's the, what's the place that you think you want to be in like 10 years from now? Or if you had like a million dirhams, what would you spend it on? So these hypothetical questions that can be easily, you can easily come up with these during um, conversation with children and they love these questions. They are so imaginative, they just need the spark. And then once you give them the spark, they go on. And good luck, good luck listening to all these ideas that they can come up with. It's actually so simple, but it's in about asking the right question to open up the opportunity for them to share and then to show the interest and just listen to that. Um, thank you, Dahlia, for your time in explaining the function and the role of a speech and language therapist, that it's more about just talking, that it is an integral part of a treatment plan of the, the healthy development within communication, um, social interaction, uh, and becoming a, a healthy citizen within a community and having meaningful connections with others. Um, thank you for shedding some light on the impact on our children in these current situations and also some tips on how we as parents 
uh, on a very practical and simple level can engage with our children through reading, through story time, through taking the time and just playing with them in, with board games, looking each other in the eye and <laughs> negotiate our way around the board, learning how to lose, celebrating the wins, and also use the, the table, the supper table as a means for communication and sharing our lives and our experiences to show kindness and curiosity and therefore enhancing the development that is at this point um, to a certain degree impacted by our circumstances that we can minimize it to the point of which we have control over. So thank you for your time thank you, Dave. and for our listeners. It's a pleasure, Dahlia. For our listeners, if there are parents out there who are struggling or who notice these challenges within their children, please reach out. Um, you can contact us at the Lighthouse Arabia. We have Dahlia here with us um, who can assist you in, in, in the different um, therapeutic interventions that we currently offer. Again, as I say each week, you do not need to go through this alone. We are here as a team to support you. Um, and thank you for listening and have a lovely day. Dahlia, I'll see you in the kitchen. Take care. Bye-bye.